I was 11 when I discovered sex. Before then, I knew almost nothing. I worried everyone my age and even younger children had greater familiarity with sex. So I set out to continue discovering like a Com Columbus or Magellan of carnal affairs. The journey taught me more than I bargained for. I grew up in a household where sex was rarely, if ever, mentioned. When I was nine, my parents separated out of the blue and my dad moved into an apartment. The only cause I could come up with was the many late nights he had been spending at the office. As I was making my way through sixth grade, their divorce would become final. Only two distinct memories of mine relate to sex prior to the year I was 11. The first memory is when I was in second grade. I and my brother, who was 18 months younger, came home from school one day after learning the F word. We understood fuck to be a fierce word that should be employed sparingly, and then proceeded rapidly to let the F-bombs fly. <laughs> this didn't sit well with our mother, who warned us, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> when he arrived after work, my mother apprised him of our verbal transgressions. Dad calmly, calmly pulled Larry and me into the kitchen, closed the louvered doors, and had us sit quietly at the oak kitchen table. This is what he said. Fuck is when a man sticks his penis into a woman's <laughs> vagina. It's not a nice word. Don't ever say it again. This explanation, all we got, <laughs> left my brother and me fascinated and horrified. But we didn't utter anything to our father other than a promise never to use the word. Larry and I shared a bedroom, and that night as we lay in our separate beds, my brother and I whispered to each other across the darkness about dad's terse definition. <laughs> we both had penises. We knew what they were for. Why, we wondered, would a man want to pee inside a woman? <laughs> The second sex-related memory that I have is from two or three years later. <laughs> Our next-door neighbor, Mr. C, was a very open-minded psychiatrist whose kids told some neighborhood boys we just had to hear what he said about sex. One day, the psychiatrist's older son, then only six years old, saw the time was right and gleefully prompted his father in front of us, Dad, what does sex feel like? And without any hesitation, Mr. C smilingly told us, it's warm, comfortable, and cozy. <laughs> we boys giggled. But it only made my understanding of sex all the more confusing. Peeing inside a woman's vagina? Warm, yeah. But comfortable? I had no older sibling who could enlighten me on the ins and outs of sexual relations, nor was I friendly enough with any older neighbor boy or girl to approach them with questions. My mother loved Shakespeare, Beethoven, and the graceful dancing of Fred Astaire. Anytime, every time, my brother and sister and I asked her about sex, she made a face of distaste and told us she wouldn't discuss it with us. My father used to carry us to bed on his shoulders and did Indian guides and Cub Scouts with Larry and me. But from the time he'd moved out when I was nine, he had been slipping away from us. He seemed preoccupied when we saw him for dinner once or twice a week or went to his apartment every other weekend. He was barely interested in our lives anymore. We never brought up sex with him. My real sexual discoveries literally began with a book. That year I was 11, school year 1970. The book, a bestseller, was making its rounds among the mothers of my West Los Angeles neighborhood. Its title, The Sensuous Woman. 
I sensed the book had something to do with sex and had no idea why my mother had it, <laughs> much less why she left the book lying out on the kitchen counter. It's not like she went out on dates after my father left. Was the book her way of helping us children learn about sex <laughs> without having to explain it herself? One day when no one else was in the house, I grabbed the book and opened it. There were too many words still alien to me at 11, words like masturbation and orgasm. But I kept thumbing through the book and stumbled on a chapter that made my eyes bug out. It instructed women on ways to use their mouths on a man's penis. One such technique was called the butterfly flick. <laughs> Another was called the whipped cream wriggle. <laughs> it struck me as bad enough men peed inside women's vaginas. <laughs> Yet this author was recommending women take action that would lead men to pee in their mouths. <laughs> I was fascinated and mystified. <laughs> I skimmed a few other sections. Despite how little I understood, I could see sex, in the author's view, was meant to be fun and a way for people to give pleasure to each other. I was eager to read more, but the book was gone from the house before I got the chance. <laughs> other sixth grade boys were finding the sensuous woman in their homes, and during one recess, <laughs> A friend, Philip, asked me if I'd read the chapter on female masturbation. And I said yes, and nodded knowingly at his commentary on the contents. I was lying. Too embarrassed to tell Philip I skipped that chapter because I didn't know what masturbation was. <laughs> Weeks later, again during recess, a bunch of boys in my class were huddled on the playground. Curious, I joined them and soon had a wrinkled magazine page thrust into my hands. It was full of photos of naked women with men's penises in their mouths. <laughs> Maybe they had read The Sensuous Woman? <laughs> the penises were erect and the biggest I'd ever seen. Remember, I was only 11. Some were so large, I wasn't sure how the woman in the picture had wrapped her lips around them. <laughs> I looked just long enough to realize once again there was more going on to this sex thing than I understood. I was close to traumatized for a week or so because in looking at my own male member while showering, I was highly doubtful it could ever grow as large <laughs> as the penises in the photo. <laughs> Mired in my ignorance, I remained insecure about sex I knew I couldn't ask mom for help understanding. She out-Victorianed the Victorians. <laughs> and my father grew ever more distant. Some of the mysteries were cleared up a short while later when all my school's sixth grade boys attended our first and only sex education assembly. It was put on by the lone male teacher at the school, Mr. Torsha, and by a very kindly local physician. They showed us a grainy old film that discussed the male and female reproductive organs and explained that during the sex act, something called semen leaves the penis, enters the vagina, a sperm finds the egg, and that is how babies are made. Conception to birth took nine months, we learned. This was a huge aha moment for me. The penis, it turned out, was a far more sophisticated organ <laughs> than I previously understood. <laughs> I had watched the film with rapt attention. It never made clear how long the sex act was supposed to last. Seconds? Minutes? Hours? My ignorance and insecurity left me with one gnawing question that sent me down the aisle to confront the doctor and teacher. They towered over me, looking down benevolently at this little 11-year-old boy, looking up at them nervously. Do you have a question, the doctor asked. I nodded, 
and summoned all my courage. When you were having sex, I asked, how do you know when to stop? <laughs> there was a brief moment of silence. Then the two men glanced at each other, chuckled a little bit, and assured me I needn't worry. <laughs> Mr. Torsha put a fatherly hand on my shoulder, looked me in the eye, and said, you'll know. I would have doubts about that for several more years, <laughs> but I did leave the auditorium that day with a newfound appreciation for sex. Not only was it apparently a pleasure, but it also had the capacity to create life. So, I was 11 years old with a slowly gained but greater understanding of sex than a year earlier. I had learned sex made penises grow gigantic, I had learned some women put a man's penis inside their mouth. I had learned sex has the power to create life. Somehow, I gathered it was all supposed to be about connecting. It was not long after the assembly that my parents' divorce finally went through. My dad came to pick up my brother and sister and me for our weekly dinner with him. As we were driving away from our neighborhood, dad sprung a surprise on us. I'm taking you, he said, to meet your new family. We were heading to a house where we would meet our new stepmother, Anne, her daughter from a previous marriage, and two little girls who were our half-sisters. This news unleashed a jumble of emotions and thoughts that were interrupted when we arrived at the house. Chatty two-year-old Jennifer greeted us excitedly at the door while one-year-old Jessica came crawling after her. We were so busy with the two girls and with our stepsister for the next couple hours that I didn't have time to ponder or process my emotions. On the drive home, I sat there thinking. Jennifer was two years old. Procreation expert that I had become, <laughs> I knew there are nine months between conception and birth. My parents were separated for exactly two years before the divorce was final. Jennifer was conceived nine months before my dad moved out. Conclusion, my father had had sex with Anne while he was still coming home to share a bed with my mother. He had cheated. My father dropped us off, and we told our mom about our new family. I can barely imagine how she felt. The knowledge my father had had an affair must have devastated her. I've never felt for her more than I felt for her that night. Sex might be about connecting, but some sex tears apart. This final lesson of that fateful year permanently changed my own relationship with my father. I am 65 and he is 91. And though I've tried, I haven't found a way to repair the bonds he broke. Doug Haberman, ladies and gentlemen, Doug Haberman.